The scripture this weekend comes from the Gospel of Mark. As you might imagine, at the beginning of the Gospel story. Mark 1, 4 through 15. And so John the baptizer appeared in the desert, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to John and were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist and he ate nothing but grasshoppers and wild honey. In the course of his preaching, John said, one more powerful than I is to come after me. I am not fit to stoop and untie his sandal straps. I have baptized you with water, but the one to come will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And it was then that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan River by John. Immediately upon coming out of the water, Jesus saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And then a voice came from the heavens. You are my beloved, my own. On you my favor rests. Immediately the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness and he remained there for 40 days and was tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels looked after him. Well, friends, it's hard to fathom a more disturbing, more dreadful beginning to a new year than what we've experienced in these last few days. It's You might think we would have deserved something far calmer and serene, let's say, after the year that we've just endured. Isn't a new year supposed to bring with a clean slate and a fresh start? I mean, instead, it's like our worst fears of 2020 are erupting in the opening hours of 2021. I mean, a year ago, could we have expected any sitting president to attempt to reverse the election he didn't legitimately win at the ballot box? Would we have foreseen members of Congress pursuing a strategy to defy the Constitution in stunning contradiction to the oath of office they pledged to uphold just a few days earlier? And even the most cynical among us would not have predicted an armed mob attacking and laying siege to the Capitol building in an act of violent insurrection. And now we're realistically worried, worried about the possibility of civil war with potential, potential for violence and bloodshed that this country hasn't seen since the days of Lincoln. And of course, this occurs in a time when the coronavirus pandemic is reaching its highest rate of infection nationwide with a 24-hour death toll that exceeds the losses that we suffered on 9-11. I mean, this is, the, this is the substance of apocalyptic horror. And it's only the second week of January. I mean, what happened with turning the page of the calendar? Where's the clean slate that promises a fresh beginning? Can we turn the clock back on 2021 and start over? I mean, we hoped that life would be different once the ball dropped on 2020. And yet we might ask ourselves, why? Why did we believe that? What difference does a single week or two make in the larger arc of history? Yes, we measure our lives by units of time, We refer to 2021 as if it's somehow categorically different than the year 2020, though we know the change of calendar is little more than an artificial distinction. And likewise, we refer to different periods of our time, of our lives, our teens and our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, and so forth, as if somehow who we are as individuals is distinctly different at each age. But does time or age really have anything to do with it? Does it have anything to do with it? I mean, what if there was no calculation of time? 
If there are no calendars, no dates, no ages by which we measured the course of our lives? What if instead we obsess the progression of our lives like the rhythms, the cycles of nature, where there really is no chronological sense of time, but only seasons of growth and development? How would we calculate who we are based not on how old we are or how many years we've had or have left, but instead on how much growth, how much potential, how much vitality still lies within us? What we have yet to accomplish or experience, what part of us is yet to grow or develop? I'm reminded of a Bob Dylan song where the lyrics offer a timeless sense of personal growth. You may recognize it. Lyrics go, may you grow up to be righteous. May you grow up to be true. May you always know the truth and see the lights surrounding you. May you always be courageous, stand upright, and be strong. May you stay forever young. Staying forever young. <laughs> Aside from vanity and the tricks of coloring hair or injecting Botox, how does one even do this? How does one remain forever young? Not necessarily in body, but certainly in spirit. Could we place ourselves into a sort of discovery mode by exploring something we've never experienced before? Can we be malleable? Can we be accommodating, adjusting to new realities around us? Can we avoid being rigid and stubborn in our ways and in our thinking? And if so, then years really don't matter in assessing the value of a life. If we view time as a gift, for us to use well. One way to approach spiritual and emotional growth, I think anyway, is depicted in Ecclesiastes chapter three, a passage that was made famous by Pete Seeger and, and the birds, another shout out to the 1960s here, with wisdom that calculates the enterprise of human life, not in years or by ages, but rather as a balance of activity. A balance of activity. You'll recognize these words. To everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up and it goes on many others. And within this sort of poetic balance and counterbalance, I guess, there is the recognition that life flows more cyclically and, and relative to what has occurred before. In other words, a, a season of growth and activity in one direction is followed by a corresponding one in another. And both activities are useful, they're constructive, they're related, even if they appear to be quite distinct and they contrast with each other. A time to tear but also a time to sow, a time to speak, but also a time to be silent. And when and how the pendulum swings from one activity to another, from one perspective to another, it's, is completely unrelated to the clock or to the calendar. And instead it comes through discernment. It comes through an intuitive sense that some change is due. The Greeks used the term kairos, a perspective on time that contrasted with a more familiar measurement of chronos, from which we get chronology. But kairos time, kairos time occurs when change itself is called for. That one pursuit has been satisfied and its purpose has been fulfilled and now another must develop to enable a more balanced approach and perspective. And I suppose it's really not unlike sailing. When one captures the wind to go in one direction only to then tack and head in another, catching the wind in the sails just as fully. 
And one cuts through the water to reach a destination, not by stubbornly maintaining a single position as if you had a motorized vessel, but by engaging the flow of the air from port to starboard, from point to counterpoint, utilizing the strength of the wind into the sails. And I think that serves as the metaphor for life itself, where we progress through time with a series of aspirations that provide an, an overall balance to our spiritual selves, responding to intuition and sensibility to know when a change is in order, when an adjustment in direction is called for, when the counterbalance to what has been led up to that point is necessary, just then like a sailor's tack, we begin to sense a restless spirit within us, where the motivations and the inspiration for the past no longer satisfy, no longer fulfill us, no longer suffice, and we need a change of scenery by heading out into a new direction. So how do we know when a Kairos moment comes upon us? Well, it's when we notice restlessness within us, when we're tired of routines, or when we feel as if our purpose and passion is, is waning, or we find fault with what's not working, especially, you know how it works when irritations occur that didn't annoy us when we were more enthusiastic, or when our sails were full. And like the wind being taken out of our sails, we begin to drift, we get anxious, we get frustrated, we sense discouragement and feel spiritually empty until we make a necessary adjustment and turn toward a new direction and our sails begin to flex once more. And as distressing as it may appear to be in transition, as strange and as daunting as it may seem at times, a period of restlessness and discontent is not to be feared. It's not to be feared. It's not that life has failed us or we have failed it. Rather, it's a sign that going in a different direction will grow our spirits more fully. It's simply the turning of one's life toward another purposeful pull, perhaps even with the same goal and ultimate destination in mind, but pursuing it in a new way by recapturing the wind, by recapturing the divine spirit. And a restless spirit, that's part of the rhythm of life, of nature, that signals, signals seasons of growth and development. And what I mean is if you and I were to remove all references to time and dates, we would likely view the course of our individual lives by its ebb and flow, the balancing of our lives, with those moments of change that brought about new inspiration and focus and purpose, we would recognize that our periodic restlessness is not due to something that's fundamentally wrong within us. Instead, it is our natural yearning for inspiration and renewal. And this allows us then to characterize the spiritual journeys we take, not by the calendar, not by the age, but by the turning points of our lives, the turning points of our lives. Well, I think this is what we find here in our text from Mark's Gospel, as it portrays a significant turning point for Jesus that launched an entirely new chapter in his life. As much as it might seem like a typical 20-somethings career change or aspiration, you and I have to realize that this story occurs at a relatively late stage in Jesus' life, given that being in his early 30s, in this day anyway, meant that he would be an older man, not the young adult that we presume him to be. Demographically, nearly three quarters, three quarters of Jesus' peers would have died before they reached the end of their third decade. Think about that. So this change in Jesus' life, which begins at the beginning of the gospel, occurs for him when most people of his age are settling into the latter stages of life. Throws a different perspective, doesn't it? So what did he do? Well, we know he left his home. 
He left his role as the responsible adult male for his family in Nazareth and headed 40 miles into Judea to the Jordan River region south of Galilee to receive and respond to the proclamation of that itinerant preacher, John. And yet for a firstborn male heir who was expected to remain faithful and dedicated to his role as head of the family for the remaining years of his life, mind you, this was unusual. This was unusual. This was even a potentially shameful act of independence, clearly moving him in another direction from his prescribed life, which is probably why there are so many references throughout the Gospels of Jesus' mother and siblings trying to persuade him to return home. I imagine Jesus felt pulled in two different directions. This story likely capturing a a very confusing, distressing time for him. As the text tells us, following his own public declaration to join John's movement through baptism, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Well, I read this as being Jesus' own restless spirit, struggling with the implications of this kairos moment for him, for a change that was beckoning within. You see, the wilderness is a biblical metaphor for spiritual restlessness. When you hear references to the wilderness, think of it in those terms. It's for an unsettled state, for wandering without a clearly defined purpose, for waiting upon God for guidance and direction. And much like anyone's experience with restlessness, there is stress, there is tension, there is conflict. Nothing ever feels quite right. The wild animals of our human nature contend with the better angels of our spirits. And for a time, Jesus wrestled through such an experience, the 40 days of symbolic, long-lasting testing and trials, much like Israel's 40-year sojourn through the wilderness. It is only, and it was only when the Kairos moment arrived, when John was arrested, when he was cruelly beheaded by Herod, that Jesus stepped out of the spiritual wilderness to take his place at the center of the movement. And we even see the verse. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. I sense Jesus' wilderness experience was actually a critical part of his spiritual growth and his development to prepare him for his divine calling. You see, I doubt he would have been ready at an earlier age or even to step up and replace John from his village home in Nazareth. He may not have been seasoned enough for what he was, would face in terms of opposition until he charted his way through his spiritual wilderness and dealt with his own angels and his own demons of ego, of self-preservation, of moral responsibility for his family and the like to summon then the courage to leave. And yet it was the wilderness testing that enabled him to make that clean and complete break from his past to carry out his calling for the future. And I dare say he would not have been the Jesus of history had he not suffered through all the emotions and struggles and deprivations that such a period of wrestling imposes upon the human soul. A restless spirit, I believe, is what led him to be the anointed one of God. Now, as I said earlier, this isn't calculated by the calendar, isn't prompted by reaching a certain age. At any time or stage in life, you and I may find ourselves in a spiritual wilderness that beckons for us to change in some way, in some manner. We may respond to it, we may not, but we will wrestle with it through a restless spirit searching for a purpose. And New Year's resolutions may have nothing to do with provoking a moment for us to take stock of ourselves, 
But I'll tell you, a restless spirit will. A restless spirit will. And if we trust and wait upon God, it will eventually help us discern and fully realize that a change in course is necessary to rediscover the wind, to fill our sails once again. Now all of this is to say, restlessness is not something to fear or deny. In the balance of life, there's a time to mourn that eventually will give way to a time to dance. And we already know there are times to laugh and there are times to weep. There are times to gain and there are times when we will lose. There are times for conflict and there are times for peace. And we don't always know when transitions come upon us or when necessary changes will occur, but if we trust the Spirit, we will know when it's time to leave the past behind. Now, I don't know what this means for every person, but I do sense that we are struggling in a wilderness period as Americans. We are pulled in at least two different directions. And it's gotten quite ugly, quite threatening to our common welfare. And what we do with this restlessness in our collective spirit will likely determine our destiny as a people as well as as a democracy. Will we simply react to this like it's just another reminder of 2020? Or will we embrace the restlessness as something purposeful? leading to a season of growth and development? Will we respond to our problems and shortcomings and improve things for the better? Will we counter our disappointments of the past with some adjustments to foster a more promising future? You see, restlessness is not something to fear, but our response to it very well could be, very well could be. If we embrace change made necessary by the past or present, it will be our best way forward, even if we don't know what that will mean. And yet we can follow the path of wisdom, both ancient and modern, to help us find our way. May you grow up to be righteous. May you grow up to be true. May you always know the truth and see the lights surrounding you. May you always be courageous. Stand upright and be strong. May you stay forever young. Join me with prayer. As we've entered into this new year, O oh God, it does offer us a chance to reflect on the past and the future, much like the two-faced Roman god of Janus, from which we get the month's name. But we can look to the past and to the future more profoundly at times of transition, at, at whatever age, at whatever stage, in whatever year or time of the year, we embrace it. Give us wisdom we need. Help us not to panic or be afraid of restlessness within people, or even within ourselves. But allow us to see the value of such wilderness periods so that we can see if changes must be made and what those changes might be. And help us to find our way through the difficult months and sometimes years it'll take until we get the wind in our sails full again. Be with us individually, 
in whatever way that speaks to us personally. And be with us as a nation. And may we be the better for it. In Jesus' name.